Of all the rituals that societies have, I think the commemoration of the dead is one of the most important. And we have very specific ways of commemorating dead warriors. In Britain, the major ritual on Remembrance Sunday is a very formal commemoration in London. Of course, it happens throughout the UK, but the, the focus of the country is really on the cenotaph. This is where the establishment shows itself to be mourning and paying its respects. And even though the faces change, basically it's the same every year. And in a way that makes it comforting. I really wanted to make a human memorial, something that was not comforting, had a random quality to it and was decentralised. A memorial that travelled around the country, not one that you had to travel to and would then find the audience. It wouldn't wait for an audience. I think it was important that even if people didn't really want to see it, they would have to see it. It had to be a different kind of commemoration. My name is Jeremy Della. I'm an artist, but I don't draw or paint. And in a way, my raw material are people or are history. A lot of the major work I've done is based around conflict. So, for example, I did a project in 2001 where I reenacted a confrontation from the miners' strike that had originally happened in 1984. It was called the Battle of Orgreave. I experienced it on TV. I was still at school. I was a teenager. It had a really big effect on me, so I, th I wanted to make a piece of research about that and make a reenactment of it. And I went back to the original spot where it had happened, and I got nearly a thousand people to reenact this riot. And I used local people, former miners, former policemen, but also members of reenactment societies. And in a way, it was like a, a public inquiry into a piece of British history through art, but also it was like a recreation of a crime scene. To be honest, after I'd done that, I never thought I'd do a big project again. In 2014, I was asked by 1418 Now to think about how the anniversary of the first day of the Somme could be marked. The Battle of the Somme was a, a major offensive by the British Army. On the first day of the Somme, over 19,000 British soldiers were killed and 40,000 were very badly injured. So it's quite strange in a way that you might think this was going to be commemorated as the 100th anniversary, but obviously it's a very important moment in British life. So I had this idea for soldiers to appear on the 1st of July and walk around contemporary Britain and I made a mock-up how I felt it could look. And I used photographs of soldiers relaxing and transplanted them onto very normal scenes of British everyday life, almost banal scenes. You'd had these strange visual jolts. When I was researching the project, I read about phenomena in Britain during the war of women mainly seeing their dead loved ones in the street, just catching a glimpse of someone on a bus or through a shop window, thinking it's their husband or their brother or their son. It became quite a big thing, all these sightings, these apparitions of the dead. So it, it was as if the project had already happened during the war. People had already seen the dead in the streets. You're in charge of what positions and how you stand and how you, how you move. Less is more. It's very natural. Um, it's very human. The idea is the easy part with things like this. And I knew that I needed to have a partner that could help me make this happen because it, it would have been impossible otherwise. It's all three, everyone lined up in a line. So it became a collaboration between myself, the National Theatre and Birmingham Rep, and between the three of us and all these other theatres around Britain we made this thing happen. It had to be a national project because the people that were killed on the first day of the Somme were from all over the United Kingdom. So it, it was a national disaster, it was a national trauma.
like any battle that has to be kept a secret, this project had to be kept a secret as well. And I think that's what, probably what separates it from being street theatre, if you like, to an artwork. Because you come across something and you're not prepared for it. And then it might be more of a shock, it might be more surprising, and so the effect would be much more profound. Well, we had two years to do this. Most of that was just organising how we were going to get the people, get the costumes, and then the last two months was really the rehearsals. Because it was a secret project, we had to recruit people by saying something interesting is going to happen, would you like to take part? Which is actually quite difficult, because I wouldn't do that. There's no way I would take part in something like that for something so vague. Welcome. Good morning. This is the first time that we've put Groups A and Group C together. So say hi, Group A to Group C. Yeah. Group C to Group A. Hello! <laughs> we were basically looking for people who were the right age, which could be anything from 16 to 50, because that was the age range of people that were killed on the first day. And who had to be healthy and fit, because they would be quite strenuous on the day, and also the training at times was quite strenuous. We wanted them to be enthusiastic as well and willing to take orders. It's a little bit like an army. Number four is we're going to sprint on the spot for 10 seconds and all count down from 10 to 1. Let's try that. Four, ten, nine, eight, seven, six. We ended up with over 1,600 participants, which I was actually quite impressed about because that's 1,600 people who had no idea what they were doing at the beginning of the process and stuck with us during a, was it a European Cup or World Cup? I can't even remember. I don't really care. What I learned very quickly was that the theatre in Britain is very different from the art world in that they're very good at organising people. Go! They're not intimidated by bodies, basically, and by people moving and by enthusiasm. The art world tends to be full of slightly miserable people like myself, who are slightly cynical and are kind of pessimistic about the world. I'm sort of generalising here, but that's how I feel. Whereas the theatre is full of people who are really positive <laughs> and really into things. We all go down this way, and all of you lot come and sit over here. Rufus Norris, who is the director of the National Theatre, played a very key role in the project in that early on he was an advisor to me and then helped shape the classes. Uh, so you folks who are sat, just uh, just move, just set back a bit, just in case this game turns into a can can. Uh, and let's and let's shift it all the way down there so we can get everybody more or less in a line. He also has authority, and so it was good to have that behind me because I'm not experienced in the world of theatre. The person I worked with most on it was Emily Lim. She was translating my ideas into something that could be performed. I'll describe this in more detail, but when you're in these tableaux, uh, it's not a sense of striking a pose or holding a pose, and I'm sure these guys have uh, started to tuck into this with you. It's very, very, very important that you always feel alive. The training happened in 27 locations around the UK, and that included Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. So at any one night in the build-up, there might have been over a 1,000 people all over the UK doing this, more or less the same thing. If I'm with Shaka and we're standing on an escalator and Shaka's looking at me because he's been an excellent member of this project and trying to engage me with eye contact, and he's looking at me and he's, and he's, he's not smiling, he's not allowed to smile, um, and he's just looking at me and he's not intimidating, and I look at him and we ride the escalator together. And then I come to get off the escalator. Does Shaka feel like we shared a moment? Yeah, yeah he does. <laughs> <laughs> right, one, two, three. Okay, camera change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Strangely, I wasn't nervous in the lead up because I just sort of lost control of it. I didn't really know what was going to happen. And I just thought, well, I can just blame the National Theatre if this goes wrong. <laughs> the 
the only thing I was really nervous about was the weather. Because really, people had been trained so well and it had been drummed into them how to behave. The uniforms were really accurate down to the battle patches and all the, you know, the cap badges. So it was going to look great, whatever I felt. But like a lot of art, it was an experiment. What if you did this plus this equals what? So First World War soldiers plus the British general public on July the 1st equals big punch up or people like this outpouring of grief or, or whatever. And this was really a large social experiment. Hi, I'm Rufus Norris. I'm director of the National Theatre. Hello, I'm Jenny Waldman. I'm director of 1418 Now. Hello, I'm Jeremy Della. I'm the artist on this project. I'm Emily Lim. I'm the lead associate director. Today we made a little video beforehand and we did this little G up to the troops, as it were, just telling them, good luck today, enjoy yourself and so on. It was Emily's idea to make a, a film of all the groups around the UK to say hello to the other groups. So to see these groups from other parts of Britain all shouting, saying, you know, here we are, we're going to do it, and getting excited was really great, actually. It was a brilliant idea. It wasn't just 30 guys in Shetland. It was actually 1,600 guys throughout Britain doing it. So it, that was their army, effectively. So as if to prove that I can't draw, I'm going to make a drawing of uh, the UK. The day started in about 17 places around the UK, and that includes Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, and the breadth of England. From that point, the men would disperse and they would go to other cities and towns. So then you'd, you'd have this proliferation and they would go to maybe an extra 30, 40 cities and towns around Britain. I mean, I really believe that if you're making public art, you're making it for the public. And after all, the British taxpayer were ultimately paying for this work. So that's why I wanted the breadth of it, to try and go as to many places as, as possible. I was very clear about how I wanted the day to begin because I realised that for maximum social media impact, you should start the day at transport hubs where thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of people would see the work, experience it at least. And so we started all throughout the UK, more or less in railway stations or bus stations. And that was just a way for a lot of people to see it, to, so you get your value for money quickly, but also people start taking photographs, they start posting things online, and then you start that ball rolling, and you just see where that goes. So in a sense, you lose control of the project through social media quite quickly, which was good. Weirdly, it became a digital project, even though it involved 1,600 human beings. What I really wanted was for the ownership of the project to begin with me, then go to the participants, but then really to filter out and become the public. So in a way, the public took ownership of the project. They were the ones who documented it. They were the ones who talked about it. They were the ones who basically it was for. I wanted the men to look out of place, to maybe look a bit strange, to be unexpected. I did want a visual incongruity, a visual shock almost. I was keen to avoid war memorials, churches, castles, any imagery for the soldiers to be around that suggested the war. I wanted them to take this kinetic living memorial to places that didn't exist in 1916, to shopping centres and high streets that were unrecognisable from 1916. We had to go to places that were awkward, and maybe that's where the art is in it, really, going to somewhere where you really are not sure what the reaction might be, but you have to push what's acceptable. We're gonna get on the tube. 
We're going to go to uh, Stonebridge Park. We're going to walk along the North Circular. We're going to go to Ikea and Tesco, see what happens. There's actually a sort of humour within some of this work because I think a lot of people associate IKEA with misery. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> Being in a miserable, <laughs> confusing place, which you can't get out of. And I just felt that was great. They were wandering around these shops that you just get lost in, you don't know what's going on. Sort of lost in consumerism, basically. Almost the first thing I wrote down in my notebook when I was planning this was avoid sentimentality because it's so easy to sentimentalise soldiers and old soldiers. And especially when something is out of living memory, we tend to forget what it was actually like. And when we lose that connection, that's when the sentimentality kicks in. So as part of my research, I was listening to audio of soldiers from the First World War who were interviewed in the 1960s and 70s and maybe for some of them it was the first time they'd spoken openly about what had happened to them. It seemed to me eventually I was just one man left. I couldn't, I couldn't see anybody at all. All I could see was men lying dead, men screaming, men on the barbed wire with the bowers hanging down, shrieking, and I thought, what can I do? It was, it, it, I, I was just alone in a hell of fire and smoke and stink, and so... I began to creep back towards the line, through shallows, through the mud, and down into the trench. There's almost nothing more sentimental and heart-rending than an old soldier with all his medals on. But then, in these interviews, when you hear them speak, you have no sentimentality there at all. They're still traumatised by their experiences. And this, for me, was very helpful in tightening and toughening how I felt about the project. People wanted to know, you know, what it was like because I was the, the first casualty in our village. I, I was the first one. And I was wounded on May the 3rd. And uh, I happened to be the very first casualty. So, of course, it all went round. And uh, everybody I met wanted to know what it was like. And I told them it was some kind of hell, which it was. So it was impossible to... Uh, to tell them really just how it was. You, t you told them the story of uh, how men were, at one moment were alive and the next moment they were dead. You know, it was just like that. People didn't seem to realize, you know, what a terrible thing war was. They, they didn't, you couldn't convey, you know, the awful uh, state of things where you live like animals and behave like animals. They just didn't understand it. I was keen for it not to be patriotic, which of course is difficult when you're dealing with warfare and nationalism. But I was trying to downplay that element to the project. So at one point we almost were going to have German soldiers on the streets of Britain. But it became complicated because some of the uniforms they wore looked very much like Second World War uniforms. And of course that takes you to another place. Each participant had an identity. They were representing someone. They weren't acting that person. They can smile, they can nod, but they can't speak because they're not reenactors. But they would have these cards with them that said who they were representing. Basically, I just said, give a card out if anyone is paying you any interest. That means if they come up and talk to you, if they take a photograph, if they're sitting and staring at you, if you sit opposite them on the train and you make eye contact. So it's basically any time you felt you had a connection with someone, you'd give them a card. 
The cards were meant to give the essential information about the person. His age, his rank, his regiment, and the fact that he died on the first day of the Somme. And in a way, it was the information that would be on a grave. So it was like we were giving out small tombstones. Private Albert Edward White of the 1st Battalion, Hampshire Regiment, who died at the Somme on the 1st of July, 1916, aged 28 years. The cards were really the only way they could communicate with the public. And we printed them on nice paper, nice thick card, so it'd be something you actually might want to keep. If you threw it away, you were actually throwing an object away. It felt like more like an object rather than just a piece of scrap paper or something. I originally wrote in my notebook, I want to make children cry, which I know is something you should never say or think even but I thought it was important to upset and maybe frighten children. You should be frightened of war, especially because nowadays most victims of war are civilians, including children. I'd read about the song, the words were, we're here because we're here, because we're here, because we're here, to the tune of Old Lang Syne, which is basically, we don't know why we're here, we don't know what's going on, no one's telling us anything, what's the point of this? That's how it felt. It's just an act of sarcastic resignation. It's a kind of protest song by the soldiers. And I thought, well, that's, that's good. They should do that on the day. We were worried that the public would react badly to it. We had all these scenarios where, what if someone comes up to you and takes your hat? What if someone starts abusing you? What if someone wants to have a fight? What if all of this stuff? And we went into great detail. It was, we did lots of scenario planning for it. And in the end, what we should have planned for was what if someone comes up to you and you give them a card and they start crying in front of you. And the public really reacted in a way that I was very impressed by, but wasn't expecting. I wasn't necessarily even wanting, in, in a way. It was quite overwhelming. We will give the British people a referendum with a very simple in or out choice. Do, do, do. Right. By chance, we did this piece, which had been planned for years, a week after the EU referendum. And I think whatever way you voted, I think we were just fed up with politicians and we were fed up with what had happened and the level of discourse in Britain. Can you shut up? Do? No, I can't nobody, shut up. Nobody wants to no, listen to you. Do, no, you nobody don't want to listen to me, Nobody wants to listen to you. That's why you don't want to listen. You've got nothing you to say. You don't want to listen because I'm 17 and you think I'm illiterate. Yeah. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. The unedifying sight of politicians trashing each other, stabbing each other in the back, lying to us. It was really depressing. And I felt it was a, it was a new low in British public life. And in a way, it reminded me of the miners' strike almost, the atmosphere in the country. People were so annoyed. And the aftermath of it was even worse than the thing itself, it felt. 
what I felt we'd had in that previous month were a group of politicians who were quite willing to sacrifice their country for their careers, effectively. Whereas with these soldiers, you'd had men who were quite willing to sacrifice their lives for their country. I was really struggling in a way of how to end the day. Do they just disappear? Do they go crazy and run around making a noise, having some sort of freak out, which is something I was quite interested in. In the end, I decided on this warm-up movement that I'd seen in rehearsals of just walking around in a circle. And when you have more than 50 people walking around in a circle in different directions, it looks impressive. And also, you know, as soldiers, you were expecting them to, to march from A to B. They always know what they're doing. They're going, they're, they have a purpose. And here it's purposeless. And it's going round and round and round, this vortex of human beings. And I thought that is probably what they should do because it makes no sense whatsoever. and they would stop and they would sing the song. And at the end of the song, they'd actually scream or make a noise. We didn't reveal anything about the project until it was over, because what I didn't want is for it to become known as, oh, that's an artwork, or that's the National Theatre doing something, because that actually takes the experience away from where it should be, which is actually just seeing this thing and being slightly puzzled by it. But also it, it gives the public a bit of space to make up their own mind, but also make up their own story about it, really, and what they think about it. It was a huge project with a lot of planning and with a big budget as well, but I wanted it to be ephemeral. I didn't want it to exist beyond that day. I wanted it to reside in people's memories, but also, of course, nowadays, it, it resides in the extended memory of the Internet, in this 21st century place. And I like that. <laughs> 